Tonight on Mississippi Insight, a crisis in the Gulf as flood water poisons the wildlife and harms the tourism industry. Does our state need a seat at the table when it comes to the Bonnie Carey spillway? And I sit down with Mississippi State Representative Mark Baker, one of three Republicans seeking to be the state's top prosecutor. Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. Let's get right to it. Our first guest represents the state's 4th Congressional District, an area that relies heavily on tourism and fishing. Congressman Stephen Palazzo joins us now from Washington. And Congressman, thank you for joining us. Well, Congressman Palazzo, let's talk about what's going on Bye, down there. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Let's talk about what's going on on the Gulf Coast right now with the algae bloom. How is that affecting uh, the folks along the Gulf Coast and particularly in tourism? Well, it, it's having a serious impact uh, right now on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, you know, the water that came through the uh, Bonnie Carey spillway into the Lake Bourne and Lake Pontchartrain, it's just the, the freshwater uh, intrusion and inundation has been devastating to our fisheries. Uh, and with the algae bloom, you know, majority of the, uh, I think if not 100% of our water sources have been closed. But I wanna let everybody know our beaches are still open. Uh, we have tons of amenities on the Mississippi Gulf Coast Coast, uh, for you and your family to enjoy without actually having to, um, you know, go into the water itself. Uh, plus, you know, we have be the National Seashore uh, where that has been unaffected. Uh, very easy, jump on a Ship Island um, excursion and go to Ship Island and just see uh, the beautiful assets that we have along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I know with reports of, of the uh, the algae bloom, a lot of the businesses down there are saying that it's been affecting their business. So we talked to a jet ski owner who said that because this came right during the 4th of July, uh, that basically he's going to have to sell off a lot of his jet skis. What is the impact is that going to have on a lot of the other businesses, small businesses that are down there? Well, I... I any business that you know their livelihood is dependent upon the Mississippi Sound, whether you're a fisherman, a, a recreational fisherman, charter boat captain, uh, pro food processor, anybody that depends on uh, a healthy uh, Mississippi Sound for their livelihood is going to be adversely affected. That that is why you know I've been reaching out to Secretary Ross over and over again for an expedited uh, fisheries disaster declaration. Uh, so we we you know we can't wait. You years for the declaration uh, because these people are hurting now and we need to provide uh, assistance to them as soon as possible. What about the seafood industry? What, how is it impacting them? And I know we're saying that the food is safe to eat, but a lot of people hear that they're, they're, there's a problem with the water and people might be afraid to eat the seafood. Well, the seafood's not coming from the affected areas. It's coming from the unaffected areas, uh, you know, Texas and uh, West Louisiana, where they did not have uh, the fisheries disaster that, that we've had uh, because of the freshwater inundation. So, you know, obviously no, no Mississippi restaurant is going to serve, uh, you, know, you know, seafood that's contaminated. They're going to serve the finest seafood that they can procure um, from safe sources. So, you know, our, you know I was there uh, this past weekend. Uh, eating crab meat and shrimp and oysters. So it's, uh, you know, our, our, again, there's so many great things to do on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, we don't want, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of fear mongering, a lot of reports from the media uh, in the Northeast that just doesn't have a clue uh, what's really taking place down there. There's tons of things to do on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And I want to encourage um, anyone in the Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Louisiana market that may uh, hear this broadcast, you know, to, to feel free to come down to the Gulf Coast and enjoy yourself. Again, there's tons of things to do that don't require you to go into the immediate uh, water. What is the long-term impact on uh, oyster farmers and, and uh, others in the seafood business uh, because of what's happened with the algae bloom? It, it's it's going to it's going to take time to repair our ecosystems, uh, especially our oysters. You know, the oysters is one of those things that you know the, the shrimp and the fish. You know, it can move to where the salinity uh, is, is safe for them to um, you know to, to survive. Uh, you know, oysters unfortunately uh, they they can't get out of harm's way. Uh, but you know, we we have USM, we have DEQ, uh, DMR, we have all these scientists that are going to be studying. Uh, you know the 
the disaster and its effects, and that's part of the disaster's decoration is to get it approved as soon as possible so we can begin the eco uh, restoration, um, the, the oyster reef restorations that are going to be required to get these fishermen back in business uh, as soon as possible, but also to be able to provide financial um, assistance to those who have been adversely affected because their livelihood is dependent upon uh, a healthy Mississippi uh, sound. When it comes to the Bonnie Carey, should the Mississippi have a seat at the table when there's a decision made about opening up the Bonnie Carey spillway? Byron, a a absolutely. So, you know, there, there should be someone in the room, and, you know, we've recommended that to um, the, uh, Major General Kaiser and Secretary James and others that, you know, we need to have someone in the room uh, that can, uh, you know, voice their opinion. I'd like to have somebody that has a background in fisheries. And even before the Bonnie Carey uh, was open, there should have been an an ecological and a fisheries uh, study impact study done so we would have been able to prepare uh, if, if it you know ultimately was to be opened uh, you know even though there may be some damage we, we could have you know prepared more uh, for this disaster so there's several things that we've been working on one you know minimize the damage um, that has already been done but to me the genie's already out of the bottle that's why this disaster disaster decoration is so important to expedite it now to get assistance uh, to those whose livelihood is being affected, and then to mitigate against uh, future disasters and decisions like this. You know, use a 1920s technology, 1920s um, you know, decision-making process, 100 years later, is that still appropriate? So I'm pushing for a complete study of the Mississippi uh, River, uh, you know, having uh, someone from Mississippi or the lower Mississippi Valley that's adversely affected to be in the room in the decision-making processes, and also, you know, to see, like, if could they have opened the Merganza a little bit uh, to relieve the pressure of, the, of the, all the fresh water um, coming into the Mississippi Sound? So you know we're gonna we're gonna study this. We're gonna make sure a study is conducted, and hopefully there's things that we can mitigate against future disasters. Uh, you know we can learn to help us mitigate against future disasters. And, and what is the concern going down the road as far as this not happening again? Well, you know, the, for, the, the biggest thing, this was the largest uh, water event that we've had since 1895. I mean, everything that, you know, could have, you know, happened has happened. Um, all the river systems north of us uh, that flow into the Mississippi River Basin, they, they, they've all flooded tremendously uh, this year. And so we, we want to study the whole Mississippi River. What could we have done to averted uh, the you know, opening the Bonnie Carey and, and, and basically destroying, um, you know, the, the, the you know, at least short term, uh, you know, the fisheries in the Mississippi Sound. And so, again, you know, the, um, the Corps, uh, the Mississippi River Commission, we're going to mandate them to study this and, bring, and come back to us uh, with, with the answers that we're going to ask them and how do we mitigate against future disasters. I, I don't have those answers right now, but we're going to require that of them in the future. All right. Congressman Stephen Palazzo, we thank you for joining us from Washington, and thank you for joining us on Mississippi Insight as well. Uh, have a good, good evening and everything else. Thank you very much, sir. When we come back, counting down to the Republican gubernatorial primary debate, a preview of the event happening right here in our studio. In just three nights, all three Republican candidates for governor will take part in their only televised debate. WJTV 12's Gerald Harris talked with the state GOP chairman for a preview. With just a few days to Mississippi's only live statewide Republican governor's debate, the excitement is in the building. I think it's great that we're going to have one uh, with the Republican candidates. I know they've all been busy working 
going door to door, speaking at events, uh, and so I think debates as being one of several ways to get their message out, I'm, I'm very glad that it's happening. Representative Robert Foster, Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves, and retired Justice Bill Waller will face off at the WJTV 12 studios. Chairman Smith says it's the strength of the Republican Party to have three top tier candidates. Uh, and I think it's why you've got three great candidates running for governor, because they know at the end of the day, whomever uh, Republican primary voters choose is going to be the person that uh, Mississippi voters choose in November to be our next governor. The MSGOP and the chairman are prevented from endorsing any one candidate in primaries. So we've got great candidates who are running uh, and the primary voters are going to decide who their nominee is and then we're going to make sure that that nominee wins. And at the end of the day, that's the choice to voters uh, that voters will have in November. Do you want to vote for a conservative who's going to continue conservative policy, who's going to represent conservative values, or do you want to vote for the liberal? Uh, it, it's that simple. The chairman says the candidates should present ideas to build on the past eight years of Mississippi GOP leadership. I'm just looking forward to continuing to hear uh, from the three great candidates that we've got from governor, the specific plans that they've got and how they want to continue the Republican conservative effort to move Mississippi forward and make it the best place in America to raise a family, start a business, uh, build a career, uh, which is really what the Republican uh, Party is all about. The debate will air on WJTV and online at WJTV.com on Tuesday, July 23rd. Reporting in Jackson, Gerald Harris, WJTV 12. It's the state attorney general whose job it is to defend the laws passed by the legislature, a job state representative Mark Baker says Jim Hood is not doing. We sat down with Baker and asked him why he wants to be the state's chief legal officer. Thank you, Byron. Glad to be here. Well, talk a little bit about why you're running for attorney general. Well, I, you know, after four terms in the Mississippi legislature, I've looked at this office of attorney general, and I believe that it's time that Mississippi had a conservative in this office as attorney general. I think that the, the values that Mississippi holds dear need to be uh, affirmed and asserted in the attorney general's office. I think about the fetal heartbeat law that we passed this year. Two days after Governor Bryant signed that bill into law, Mississippi was sued. You know, I think that uh, we knew the lawsuit was coming, but we need an attorney general who's going to defend that vigorously. And if you'll remember, just a few short weeks ago when that, when that, when that law was challenged in federal court, our attorney general did not show up. Mm -hmm. And that's just not, that, that's just beyond the pale for me. We need an attorney general in Mississippi who will show up for the fight and won't run from it. In 16 years in the legislature and 32 years of law practice, I can tell you there's one thing that I'm not known for and that's running from a fight. The previous abortion law that was passed, the 15 week one was struck down by, uh, by, by a federal judge. It, this one now, what do you think is going to be the situation on this on the fetal heartbeat? I think that we have a court that is receptive to it and we need to push it as far and as fast as we can. Now the Alabama situation there is a little more extreme. Uh, do you think this case is going to go to the Supreme Court the way Mississippi has it or, or do you think it will? There are several fetal heartbeat laws around the country that were passed last session and uh, last year. Uh, several of those are working their way to the Supreme Court. Which one gets there first, I can't say. Mm -hmm. But do you feel confident that Mississippi has the right uh, law in place that, uh, that might make it through? I do. Yeah, well, okay, and we'll see what happens there. Absolutely. When it comes to criminal justice reform, we've had three escapes uh, recently here in Mississippi. What needs to happen here? Some are saying, some groups are saying that, there, that there's too many people in the Mississippi prison, uh, there's not enough correctional officers. How do you deal with, with that situation if you're elected Attorney General? Well, that's actually within the purview of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. As Attorney General, of course, we will look at those issues and help determine how we can, as the Attorney General, help that. But as to the matter of criminal justice reform, the, the, you know, I think it, the, the pendulum has swung too, too far away from victims, and it's much more important to put the focus back on victims. And if we need to keep people in jail, we need to keep people in jail, and we certainly need to be keeping violent criminals in jail. Mm -hmm. I know there's been some people who have been talking about uh, that the, the sentences have been too long for some nonviolent offenders. Do you support that the nonviolent offenders should be sentenced to long sentences, or should we be changing that? Well, obviously, we, we need to look at what we're talking about when we're talking about nonviolent offenders, because that's a very broad category when you start talking about that. During my time in the legislature, I voted for intervention courts that will take care of 
uh, you know, nonviolent drug offenses and things like that to where they can go through drug court and they can uh, get a new lease on life, so to speak, but still be within, within the purview of the drug court system. So if they deviate or fall off, we can, we can handle that. But, but from the standpoint of nonviolent offenders, I think we need to look at the offenses. I think there's a lot of talk that nonviolent offenders go to jail too long, but we're not seeing a lot of substance there. When it comes to mental health issues, I know a lot of the sheriff's departments have also had an issue about the fact that they are the first line of defense when it comes to dealing with the mentally ill, and that they really don't have the capacity to deal with that, bringing them into the county jails and everything else, but we don't have enough bed space. How do you address that issue? Well, that's a huge issue, and I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, several weeks ago, we heard of a court hearing in federal court where the Department of Justice is suing the state of Mississippi about how we are treating our mentally ill. It's unacceptable to me. I believe that our Attorney General should be at the forefront of working for and protecting our mentally ill. We should not require the need of the Department of Justice to come in. We should be taking care of our own. Uh, the Department of Mental Health is failing our mental Ill, mentally ill. The provisions and the services that are being provided are not adequate. And as Attorney General, I can tell you, I'm not going to need the, attorney, the Department of Justice to come in and to deal with problems that are occurring with regard to our mentally ill. I'm going to step in from day one and take care of that. And welcome back. Medical marijuana is now legal in 33 states, and recreational pot is legal in 11 states. But Republican candidate for Attorney General Mark Baker says the negatives to legalization outweighs the pros. What is your position on medical marijuana? If, if it's helping some, if it's prescribed by a doctor and it's in the care of the health department that's managing that. What would your position be on medical marijuana I, in Mississippi? I, I, I don't think we're there yet. I really don't. The medical marijuana is a misnomer. I mean, marijuana is marijuana. What you use it for is what you use it for. I think that the problems that are created by it are uh, much exceed what, what the, the concerns and the issues are addressed that pr the proponents express. We have passed in the legislature some matters with regard to C CDB oil and other things like this to help people that are engaged, that have seizures and things like this, but full-on medical marijuana is not something I'm in favor of. And some will say, it's, what's the difference between medical marijuana and, I guess, alcohol? It, 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 what, is there, what's well, your Well, you know, I mean, I always see the comparisons, mm -hmm. but they have to stand on their own. Simply because you think that marijuana or medical marijuana is less abusive or less harmful than alcohol doesn't make it better. It just, it, it, it creates its own problems. And we look at places like Colorado that have legalized marijuana, and we, and we hear, you know, it's, it's a revenue generator. All this is done, it's, it's great. But, but what we look at is, is their instances of crime, their instances of now black market sale of drugs has not gone down. The money that they're spending on uh, treatment for those that are, um, you, you know, have addiction problems and issues have, has gone up exponentially. Mm -hmm. And they're still having to spend the same amount of money, the same amount of resources and manpower fighting illegal drugs. Well, some studies are showing that teen use has actually gone down, but the use of, because of the medical marijuana. I, I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've, I've heard that, but I've looked, at the, I've looked at the data and the studies and I don't see that supported. Right. And so that's still up for debate. We'll see what happens when it comes to the medical marijuana, whether it's, it's something that will happen here in Mississippi or not. Well, it didn't come up in the, uh, the right. when it came up in the legislative session last year. It didn't go anywhere. I don't see it. I don't see it moving forward in the, in the legislature next year. But I won't be there. Right. You got an A plus rating on the NRA. You just got that this week. Uh, so how how important was that for you? It was it was it was huge. It was a, it's a great honor to be recognized by the NRA in this race as the candidate that they chose for attorney general. It's something that I've worked on in 16 years in the legislature. My position for um, uh, personal ownership of firearms and guns is, is consistent. And, uh, and for them to come in and step in and recognize that and recognize me in this race has been great. And, uh, and, and that helps you in what way as far as uh, for, with your constituents out there in this race? Well, I think it, it validates in, in many ways my position with regard to law enforcement. I go around and I tell people, you know, Jackson just is, has experienced its 54th murder, city of Jackson. 
Uh, there needs to be leadership above the county level that can come in and bring the resources and assist local law enforcement, county and local law enforcement, to begin to stop this crime epidemic that is occurring in the city of Jackson. It's, it's, it's killing the people here and, it, and it's, it's spreading out and it needs to be taken care of here and I do have a plan for that. Uh, several years ago we created the Capital Improvement Development District. Uh, that was a way in the legislature that we sent money to the city, of, to this district to provide for infrastructure needs within the city of Jackson. Uh, I believe that we can expand the jurisdiction of the Capitol Police to provide for law enforcement authority within the Capital Improvement District. And then we can create a court, through the, uh, do that through the Supreme Court. And we can have uh, courts appointed, staff appointed, and prosecutors from the Attorney General's office can come prosecute these crimes. And that will provide another level of law enforcement within the city of Jackson, which in, within much of the city of Jackson, to provide for the safety of our citizens. All right. Representative Mark Baker joining us this, uh, this evening. We thank you very much for that. You're running for Attorney General. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. In the next two weeks, we'll be joined by the other two candidates in the race for Attorney General, including State Treasurer Lynn Fitch. And a week from tonight, our guest will be Attorney Andy Taggart. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to follow us on social media and online at WJTV.com. A reminder, WJTV is hosting all three Republican candidates for governor in a debate, Representative Robert Foster, Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves, and former Chief Justice Bill Waller right here at WJTV. That's coming up on July 23rd at 7 p.m. And you can see it right here on WJTV and on WJTV.com. Join us again next Saturday night for another edition of Mississippi Insight. Until next week, make it a good night.